said, why are some people shy and some people not shy? What causes this temperamental trait? Well, the first thing we're going to jump into is the biology. What we know is shyness can be considered a temperamental trait, either low in approach in the Thomas and Chess model or as its own separate theory. And we know that this tends to be something that appears very early on in infancy and tends to be quite stable throughout the lifespan. Not all cases of shyness appear in infancy. It is also possible for shyness to appear around age five or even in adolescence or later on in the lifespan. But a lot of these cases will show early markers in infancy, possibly due to either genetics or physiology. And so one of the areas we can investigate this further is the area looking at behavioral inhibition. Now, behavioral inhibition is not considered synonymous with shyness, but it is an early predictor of shyness in that infants and toddlers who display behavioral inhibition are more likely to develop shyness when they are five or six years of age. So what's behavioral inhibition, you may ask? Well, this is the idea that we have measured physiological differences, that children who are behaviorally inhibited, um, they're behaviorally inhibited. What this means is they're inhibited to do certain behaviors in novel situations. And when they are behaviorally inhibited, we can also map this onto what's going on in their body. We tend to find that they have higher levels of stress hormone, even at times of low stress. They have a higher vagal tone. They have a faster heart rate and a faster breathing rate. So these are kids that are just more aroused, their body's more alert, just in a default setting. If there's enough chaos going on, we can really see just how calm someone is at resting and how quickly they can shoot up to a fight or flight system. And so in the work by Jerome Kagan and Nathan Fox, there's been a lot of work on behaviorally inhibited toddlers and infants and looking at how they respond to novel situations that might be a bit strange. In one of their studies where they tried to take in uh, toddlers at the age of 24 months and put them through a series of tasks to see how they reacted to novelty, they found that behaviorally inhibited infants would have a strong response early on versus less inhibited infants would make it to later stages in the experiment. In case you're wondering, there is seven steps. And in the first situation, the toddlers entered a laboratory space and it was a new room they'd never been in before. In step two, they were placed in a heart monitor and someone could feel their heart rate. Step three was someone took their blood pressure. Step four, someone asked them to have some drink some liquid out of an eyedropper. Now, if they were not already very nervous after these first four steps, at step five, a stranger, an individual, would enter the lab that they had never seen before, just to measure how they responded to them. And then at step six, a clown would enter the room. And if they mentioned to make it to step seven, then from behind curtains, a remote controlled robot decorated in Christmas lights would approach the child. And so by the end of step seven, we would expect most kids would have at least some shock and awe going on, but the kids higher in behavioral inhibition would be showing high levels of stress and shock earlier on in that experiment. Now, in addition to those early physiological markers, the work by Lewis Schmidt has also found that there's been lots of brain activity associated with behavioral inhibition and later shyness. And that is the idea that the limbic system and the self-regulatory pathways in the brain light up a bit differently in the toddlers who will go on to become quite shy in childhood and adolescence. Schmidt's work has also found that there may be some subtypes of shyness. Uh, he's argued that there is positive shyness and negative shyness, or adaptive and maladaptive shyness. And this is the idea that adaptive shyness may make someone just really more in tune to other people and able to do things like identify subtypes of smiles and identify the motivations behind smiles. Though this work is somewhat new uh, and goes against some of the other areas, as we'll see later on, is shyness and cognitions. Now we know that shyness is related to these behavioral markers such as a faster heart rate, faster or more shallow breathing. And so what we can do in terms of an intervention is try to use physiologically based relaxation techniques. For instance, it's been quite effective to teach preschoolers at young, at young ages to learn how to do deep belly breathing, such as being told to inflate the balloon in their belly. 
We also know that something like a calming massage or aromatherapy can help to relax these young individuals. And something like really vigorous exercise, although that raises our arousal level, if enough frequent exercise has taken place, that can help to lower our resting heart rate and lower our resting cortisol level. So that can help to ameliorate some of the risks associated with behavioral inhibition. Then there's just some things, uh, because we know kids high in behavioral inhibition are just more aroused and more alert, reducing some of that stimulation can actually help them. So being in an environment with the lights a little bit dim or lower noises might make them feel a little bit less stressed out. In the opposite sense, some researchers have actually uh, proposed the idea of novelty seeking training. And this is the idea that behaviorally inhibited toddlers, they're afraid of new and novel experiences. So exposing them to lots of new and novel experiences might desensitize them to it and might help them to learn some coping techniques or strategies on how to approach that in other aspects of life.